It's 25 years since the publication of Gender Trouble, and both within and without philosophy, it's been one of the most influential theoretical works of that time, and a touchstone for discussions of subjectivity and identity of all kinds. And in her writings and in conversation, Butler has made clear her indebtedness to the phenomenological and existentialist tradition while revising it within a post-structuralist framework. So in this paper, I'm exploring just one strand of that indebtedness, which is very complicated and multi-strand, by comparing the performative account of gender, trouble, uh, gender identity, which she offers in Gender Trouble, with the imaginary personages which form the basis of Sartre's account of individual and social identities. Now, in his early work on the imaginary, Sartre discusses, discusses the performance artist Franconet, a small, stout, brunette woman who is imitating Maurice Chevalier. And um, in this performance, he says, that black hair we did not see as black, and that body we did not perceive as a female body. We did not see those prominent curves. The absent chevalier comes, Sartre suggests, to possess the body in front of us. Nonetheless, for him, we are spontaneously and at each moment creating this image of chevalier by an act of imagining. For Sartre, imagining is a kind of intentional act distinct from perceiving. The act of consciousness involved in imagining is a negation of the real, in this case, Franconet's body, and the constitution of an irreal image in this case of Chevalier. And this activity of imagining takes place in a range of settings. When we imagine a friend who's away from us, when we see a doodle or a cloud as a castle, when we recognize a character in the actions of a performer, when we get, produce or engage with artworks in general. Mental images, he says, caricatures, photos, or so many species of the same genus. In each of these cases, there's something perceived which serves as what Sartre calls the analogon. Actually, I have no idea how to say that word. How do you say it with all your French knowledge? An analogon. Of the image which is created. The perceptual ground which is surpassed in the creation of the image. We seem to require something like a sensory matter which we surpass with an imagining form. In the case of the imagined chevalier, the analogon is the body of Franconet, but the characteristics are surpassed in its reimagining as the famous entertainer. Although Sartre provides an account from the point of view of the audience, a parallel account could be provided from the point of view of the performer, who, despite her curves, performatively enacts chevalier through the medium of her body and surpassing its physiology towards its imagined form. Sartre claimed his late biographical work on Flaubert, The Family Idiot, was a sequel to his work, The Imaginary. And in this work on Flaubert, as in his work on Jeunet, he gives central stage to the imaginary in the formation of the self. It is the imaginary of the self which governs the patterns of choices and projects, the performances which make up our lives. And it is the imaginaries in terms of which we experience others which mediate our relations to them. And such an account unifies the range of examples which Sartre discusses from the imaginary onwards. Franconet, the actor playing Hamlet, and in his play the actor Keane, even when he leaves the stage, is acting. And in Being in Nothingness, he gives us, of course, the example of the waiter. Let's consider this waiter in a cafe. His movement is quick, a little too precise, a little too rapid, with steps a little too quick. He is playing. He is playing at being a waiter in a cafe. He is playing because from within, he is not a waiter as an inkwell as an inkwell, but from within, he doesn't have some other real self. I can only play at being him, imagine to myself that I am he, as the actor is Hamlet, imagining at an imaginary cafe waiter, um, through whose gestures, taken as an analogue, yet there is no doubt that I am, in a sense, a cafe waiter. The performance governed by the imaginary is not in opposition to the real here, but rather all the real amounts to. Our own imaginary selves are not contrasted to real selves, Subjectively, all that we encounter is our being towards the world, an active, spontaneous self immersed in our projects. And the conception of ourselves informing those projects can be captured by invoking a character or a personage 
something like an imagined role or ideal. So that's a bit on Sartre, so now a bit on Butler. In Butler's Gender Trouble, we find a modification of the Sartrean model. For Butler, as for Sartre, the self becomes constituted out of the performative acts of ourselves and others. Governed by social ideals, images of, given her concern with gender, what it is to be male or female. When the baby is born in the midwife says it's a girl, she's not reporting a state of affairs, but taking part in a practice which constitutes that state of affairs. And it's by a repetition of numerous acts of this kind that what it is to be male or female in our society is formed. The deeds or performances which serve to constitute our identities as gendered subjects range across the whole gamut of behaviour and corporal styles which we associate with being male or female. The performances in which we engage are performances in terms of a script, as she says, and the script derives from ideal images of masculinity and femininity pervasive within society. These are imaginary and unachievable, but they form the reference point in relation to which we act. And what counts as a performance of masculinity or femininity is highly contextual, and the operative imaginaries can be variable socially, historically, and from one person over the course of their lives. So the performance of gender is interdependent with the performance of other aspects of our identity. As with Sartre, the notion of performance invokes an actor on a stage. But if we think that invoking the actor on the stage suggests a distinction between performed identity and real identity, um, this is not a distinction which either writer allows. The performance gives us as much reality as selves contain. Gender, says Butler, is a kind of persistent impersonation that passes as the real. The discussion of drag is also pivotal to Butler's account. Drag is viewed as a parodic or exaggerated form of gender enactment by means of which originary or authentic gender identity is exposed as an effect of performance. In the performance of drag, the apparently natural packaging of biology as gender is pulled apart, and the audience, aware they're watching a body sexed in a certain way, watched, watch as a gendered identity is produced, which is at variance with it. We then, she suggests, recognise that everyday gender is just such a performance. While we are aware of the dissonance between the performance and the anatomical body, the performance serves to denaturalise our views of gender. Now, despite the obvious parallels between Sartre and Butler here, there are, of course, key differences. For Sartre, the imaginaries which govern the project which make up our life are constituted, adopted by acts of subjects who are both prior to and transcend their performative constitution. And Butler's writings are relocated within a post-structuralism in which subjects come into being via subjection to social norms and neither proceed nor surpass them. For her, the constitution of imaginaries is not an intentional act of subjects, as with Sartre, but an anonymous process wrought by discursive social scripts, adoption of which comes to form our subjectivity. And this key difference leads to very different strategies in the face of damaging and oppressive imaginaries applied to us by particular others or by collective social formations. For neither writers can such imaginaries be challenged by our own authoritative access to an inner real self. But for Sartre, the imaginaries in terms of which others place us can confront our own imaginary of ourselves, which may or may not conform to that in terms of which others imagine us. In Sartre's reconstruction of Jeunet's early life, he portrays him as a solitary and imaginative child engaged in imaginary performances in which he is his own audience with two favourite games of pilfering and saintliness. The pilfering occurs within the project of gaining desirable objects by means of which he can play the more privileged child he desires and thereby imagines himself being. A crisis occurs when he is confronted with a judgement from outside, from the adults, you're a thief, he's told. He's confronted with himself as a thief and a moral monster in the eyes of others. And then we have the conflict, which Sartre immortalised in being a nothingness. Our own sense of self in conflict with the verdict delivered by others. And we struggle to make our own view prevail. In this later work, Sartre shows himself more attentive to the conditions which enable our own view to connect 
to prevail. Um, uh, he comments that when things go well, we can prioritise our being for ourselves from our being from others, and Jeunet, if things were going well, could hang on to his imaginary of himself as a saintly child who deserves desirable objects. But when things go badly, the view of others gains priority, and we internalise the view of others and regard it as our nature or destiny. It's interesting this was written at the same time that de Beauvoir was writing The Second Sex, but I'm not going to talk about de Beauvoir because there's too many things to say there. Jeunet would then accept the view that he is a thief. Initially, for Jeunet, things went badly, Nonetheless, for Sartre, there's always a tension or an unrealizability between the subjective sense of self with its own imaginaries and the, those coming from without. Jeunet resolves this tension by making himself a thief, regaining subjectivity by adopting the imaginary of the other and performing in terms of it. And later, Jeunet called his thefts poetic acts, creative ways of inhabiting the imaginary role of thief. Mm. This is one way in which Jeunet regains his objectivity in the face of the clash of imaginaries, which Sartre reports him as experiencing as a child. And later, of course, he prioritises his own imaginary view by making himself a writer and therefore in control of other people's imaginaries. What is important is to note that the conflict of imaginaries which Jeunet encounters isn't answered by an appeal to a deep inner self which at least some of the attributed imaginary characterizations contradicted. For Sartre, there is no real self with which Jeunet could confront his accusers, no deep saintliness which he could pose against the monster they presented. And what is issue here is a clash of imaginaries with issues of social power determining which imaginaries prevail. And this picture is also evoked with additional complexities in the account which Sartre offers of oppressive social imaginaries carried by the categorization of people as Jewish or Negro. The social category of Jew and at least partially Negro are molded from the imaginaries of the anti-Semite and the racist colonialist. And they cannot be counted by attention to the reality of lives of Jews and black people. For these bodies and lives serve only as the analogon which is negated and surpassed in the imaginary positive. And such imaginaries can only be partially and strategically challenged by those assigned to those groups by trying to reimagine the categories in less damaging ways, like as, for example, in the negritude movement. For Sartre argues, the categories themselves and their boundaries are created by these racist imaginaries. The very variable bodies which are brought under these categories are united only in having imaginaries applied to them not in terms of objective characteristics. In this way, for Sartre, they were different from the category of class, which I'm not going to talk about just now. They can only be changed for Sartre by shifts in social power, which lead to the abolition of the categories, in his view, by a socialist revolution. For Butler, mm -hmm. gendered performances are also tied up with power. Although there are a variety of ways in which gender can be performed, there are dominant ideals which reinforce the power of men in heterosexual people. And Sartre, uh, Butler, in parallel with Sartre, sees the imaginary as being central to the production of our categories of sex difference. For her, the categories of male and female are not a consequence of objective biological structures, but derive from the attachment of imaginaries of masculinity and femininity to certain bodies. What unites the biologically variable bodies termed female is that they are performatively imagined as female. In Sartre's terminology, the biological body and other material aspects of existence are simply the analogon through which imaginary significance is posited. It is imaginary signif signification that form our sex category, if it is imaginary signification, that forms our sex categories. This opens up the possibility that bodies of very different biological types could be imagined as masculine and feminine. And indeed, if our imaginaries are productive of binary sex difference, then imaginary significations might be changed so there wasn't simply two sexed or gendered categories. I'm doing reporting of Butler here in my own terms. These categories could disappear or be extended to others. So Butler sees sex categories as working in much the same way that Sartre sees the working of race social identities. The categories rest on imaginaries projected onto certain bodily characteristics 
And given the variability of these characteristics, what unifies the categories is that these bodies have certain imaginary content attached to them. She was constantly alert to the difficulties which Sartre realised, which made the reimagining of such categories problematic. So there's a real parallel between Sartre's response to the negritude movement and Butler's response to writings of people like Luce Irigare, who was involved in the project of reimagining woman and reimagining the female. Butler's goal is to, not to reimagine, but to destabilise and undermine the categories of sex and sexuality. And uh, for her, the opportunities for destabilizing those categories came not with a socialist revolution, but depends on the iterability of meaning which post-structuralist accounts have brought to our attention. The instability of meaning is what enables the turn and turns us towards a more enabling future. For both writers, the goal is the abolition of the problematic categories, though for Sartre this is to be achieved in historical materialist ways, and for Butler in deconstructionist ones. But it's not those differences which I want to stress today, even though those are extremely productive and loads to say about those differences. I want to suggest instead that each of their accounts runs into difficulty as a result of accepting Sartre's original characterization of the imaginary. Both writers have been criticized for paying insufficient attention to the materialities of the bodies and situations which form the analogons which are surpassed in the imagined personages that they explore. Many commentators, starting with Butler, many commentators have felt unease regarding Butler's lack of attention to the materiality of the body. And in her preface to Bodies That Matter, she reports a common response to her performative account, a response captured in the question, what about the materiality of the body, Judy? An effort to recall me to a bodily life that could not be theorized away. For surely bodies live and eat, sleep, feel pain, pleasure, endure illness and violence, and these facts, why Mike claimed, cannot be dismissed as mere construction. That's a quote from the introduction to Bodies That Matter. Now, such a query is prompted by the apparent disregard within Butler's work for any constraints on gender performance which might be suggested by our bodies. Because she emphasised the mobility of gender and the possibilities of gender crossings, any significance attached to bodily form seems to get lost. Biddy Martin, for example, while accepting that we can have no way of thinking about our bodies outside discourse, nonetheless suggests that the body constitutes more of a drag on signification that, that, and urges that we pay more respect to what is given to its limits, even as we open the future what, to what is now unthinkable or now delegitimated. These concerns have been articulated in the writings of what have recently been termed the new materialism. Although few would think we have unmediated access to materiality, including the materiality of our bodies, something that Butler's pitch, in Butler's picture the material itself has lost agency. What needs addressing, says Karen Barad, is the entanglement of matter and meaning, in which no priority is given to either side, and the new materialist discussions therefore try to ensure, in a way that had always been um, signalled, for example, by Donna Haraway, that matter, the material, is encoded an active role in this relation. Viewing matter as an active agent <coughs> ensures that matter and meaning are mutually articulated. Importantly, however, though matter takes an active part, this does not involve recording it some kind of immediate givenness or a straightforwardly determining role. Now, some of the problems here of, of disentangling and entangling matter and meaning in relation to Butler are, have be, were brought to a head when you consider the relation of Butler's theorizing to the increasingly public visibility of different kinds of transgendering. For Butler in Gender Trouble, the phenomena of transgendering served to make evident the constructedness of sexed identity. Consequently, many trans people regarded her work with its goal of destabilizing sexual binaries as the theoretical framework whereby their own histories could be made sense of. Nonetheless, for others, for example, Jay Prosser, 
the experience of transsexual people revealed difficulties with Butler's account. In Second Skins, Prosser suggests Butler can't account for the transsexual desire for um, sexed embodiment mm -hmm. rather than regarding it as a kind of misguided naturalism. The objection... Uh, sorry, I've lost my place now. The sense of having the wrong body is a recurrent motif within transsexual narratives, and the desire is to change the biological body, to bring it in line with the real gender identity, which is said to constitute the subjectivity of the person. But such an assistance on gendered realness sits in tension with the performative account and gender trouble. But also, a return to biological naturalness is also problematic, given that the body at issue is the wrong body, and therefore far from fixing gendered realness threatens to undermine it. So to summarise the, the problems with Butler and materiality, it seems that the materialities of bodies and situations have um, greater bearing on our identities than Butler's performative account seems to allow. Though it's not clear how the bearing that it does have on our identities is to be articulated. So there's an issue with Butler and materiality. Now, in relation to Sartre's account of damaging social imaginaries, a move which had been found, there's a move which has been found in the political movements which resist them, namely the claim that such imaginaries are misrepresentations that the history, cultural, social relations of the group can be made sense of within the imaginary forms which are offered for them. Fanon himself relates how he started his resistance by pointing out, I knew that these claims were false. There was a myth of the Negro which had to be destroyed at all costs. It was some time since the Negro priest was a surprise. We've had doctors, professors, statesmen, etc. And Memmi and Walser have both problematised an account of Jewish identity, which use it as composed of the projected imaginary of the anti-Semite. For this ignores the distinctive social, material and cultural histories of people, with ties which are more than and distinct from being the object of the anti-Semitic gaze. People with a sense of Jewishness deriving from a cultural and religious tradition, collective habits of thought and behaviour. These lies are invoked to show up that the imaginaries concerned are fantasies, projections from the dominant group to justify social exclusions. But the claim that the imaginaries misrepresent the character of social groupings seems to require that these groupings have an anchorage over and above their constituents being the bearers of the imaginary of the dominant group. So Jewishness is not simply co-instituted with the anti-Semite and their imaginary. Underlying these difficulties, these difficulties are of course being well heard. Underlying these difficulties is the Sartrean account of the imaginary, in which the body and other materialities used as the basis for imaginative projections are simply analogous for acts of imaginary imagining, sorry, which surpass them and which they fail to constrain. Now Sartre responds to such moves by requiring that our imaginary personages governing our sense of self and our view of others accommodate the facticities of the situation. Otherwise, they're a manifestation of one kind of bad faith, and, you know, there's plays and stuff in which are about just that. We cannot posit in imaginary purposes a personage which contradicts the facts of our present and past. It's just such facticities which are being drawn attention to, you'd say, in the accusations of willful misrepresentations above. But nonetheless, for Sartre, our imaginings are act of an imagining consciousness which negates such practicities, not by refusing to accept them, that's not what negation is, but by refusing their relevance to the imagined future. Now, the approach to the imagining which both Butler and Sartre share is, I would suggest, in contrast to that of Merleau-Ponty, who in other respects was also an important influence on Butler. Meliponti rejected Sartre's division between a perceiving and imagining, between perceiving and imagining. Uh, instead, for him, the imaginary is part of and necessary for the perceived real, the invisible in the visible. Meliponti doesn't reject the role of the imaginary in the formation of social identities, or indeed in any other aspect of the social and material world. But the imaginary for him 
is answerable to the material world, suggested by a perceived reality which for Sartre is an analogon to be surpassed. For Miller-Ponty, the imaginary shape we give our world emerges as an intelligible response to a situation which is encountered, rather than an exercise in transcendence. And social identities, if they are not simply to be oppressive fantasies projected from the gaze of a dominant group, have to crystallise what is latent in the life of those concerned. So for Merleau-Ponty, then, the imaginative self is not an unconstrained ideal which I posit, but neither is it simply a facticity to be observed. <coughs> it is one of the possible and multiple ways of bringing to expression my interrelated body and world. And it is this entanglement of matter and meaning in, which has led to Melo Pontibi having been taken up by the new materialist I mentioned above. He discusses our identities as middle class or working class revolutionaries or not, and this is part, obviously, of the argument that he had with Sartre at a particular time, which has been well documented. So when he's discussing our identities as middle class or working class revolutionaries or not, he says, I'm not conscious of being a worker or a bourgeois because I, in fact, sell my work or because I, in fact, show solidarity to the capitalist machine. And I certainly don't become a worker or a bourgeois the day I commit to seeing history through the lens of class welfare. That's a knock at culture. Rather, I exist as a worker or I exist as a bourgeois first. And this mode of communication with the world and society motivates both my revolutionary projects and my explicit judgments. He also says, it's not because the day laborer has decided to become a revolutionary and consequently to confer a value on his actual condition, but rather because he, it's not his decision, it's not a matter of decision, but rather because he perceived concretely the syn synchronicity between his life and the life of workers. Um, the commands issued by the so-called agitators are immediately understood as if through some pre-established harmony and find complicity everywhere because, and this is the crucial phrase, they crystallise what is latent in the life of all producers. Our identifications for him reflect our way of experiencing the world such that the identifications make sense of my mode of dealing with the world and society. My relation to materiality is neither one of it determining the imaginary nor one of negation. Imaginary personages... Sartre's term, are gestalts of myself and others interwoven with gestalts of the material and social world, a manifestation of the multiple possibilities of the real. He says the motivated presence of the world is dismissed by Sartre as a claim that he makes. Now, Merleau-Ponty accepts, along with Butler and contra Sartre, that the real is only available to us in terms of the imaginary. In its applications to social identity, this problematizes a view in which social groups are simply given objectively with characteristics to be discovered. He accepts, along with Butler, that what are offered as facts only carry signification within the context of an imaginary shaping. So social groupings, class, Jewishness, are not simply objective facts, though he doesn't uh, develop that thought in relation to sexed identity. Nonetheless, he sees such shaping as a creative process in which we uncover rather than posit, uh, so in which we uncover rather than posit, as in Sartre's picture, or performatively constitute, as in Butler's, possibilities of being. Imaginaries are latent within a public world, the imaginary shape of which has to make sense of our situations and invoke recognition from different positions within it. So his position is one which has room for the kinds of criticism that we've noted above. The claim that certain imaginaries of Jewishness, of blackness, of femininity, are ones which the social world simply cannot support. They are fantasies, debilitating illusions. For Merleau-Ponty, nonetheless, the imaginaries of our world, including the social world, have an openness of the kind stressed in the writings of Butler and other post-structuralists. Currently instituted social groupings are not fixed but open to alternative imaginary formation. 
So his account, while remaining answerable to materiality, um, is neither naturalizing nor conservative. Let's return to Franconet's performance as Maurice Chevalier. As Sartre points out, being plump, with a physiology designated female, and having brunette hair, doesn't look a very promising start. Nonetheless, her performance commands recognition from the audience. In Merleau-Ponty's terms, they find, to their surprise, that invoking Chevalier is one of the expressive possibilities of such a body, one which it needed her talent to make evident. What, however, of the claim made by some of the transsexual community to a real sexed identity which their unmodified body cannot express? There's loads to be said here, so I'm just saying a tiny bit. Within the framework offered by Merleau-Ponty, such a sexed identity is not simply a given facticity, an inner truth perhaps only clearly visible to the person themselves. Neither is it simply a question of which, so it wouldn't be a question, you know, like inspect the brain and that will settle it, or, you know, introspect and that will settle it. It's not going to be that kind of an, an answer. But neither is it simply a question of which sexual identity forms the imaginary personage posited by the transcendent subjectivity of the person concerned. It's not just a matter of the imagined personage in terms of which they conduct their lives. The identity claim must, as we have noted before, for Meloponti, not that he discusses this, crystallize what is latent in the life. And to do that, it must be one with, at least, which, with which at least some others who were familiar with that life could recognize as appropriate. Now, whether that's, that's all about the claim to be really a woman or really a man. But then what about the, the demand that that identity, even if it's established as being appropriately female or male, when it sits in opposition to the physiology, which is normally taken as the marker? What about the claim that that identity is not expressible via a certain physiological form? So that a female identity, it's claimed, is not expressible by a physiology which we now designate as male. It's not graspable as one of its possibilities currently. Now I think that what could be graspable as one of the possibilities of a body is highly contextual actually. And I think it's probably right that just here and now it's not possible to grasp masculinity as one of the possibilities of a female body, but actually more, much more femininity as one of the possibilities of the male body, um, what's now termed a male body. But that night, and so that's why there is a demand for surgery, but that, I think, could change. Anyway, that I've written about that at length elsewhere, so i just throw that in as something you might want to think about to summarise. In this paper... I have suggested a parallel between Sartre's account of self-identity in terms of the adoption or projection of imaginary personage and Butler's account in terms of a social script. In each case, I have suggested the accounts face problems from regarding material embodiment and other aspects of material and social existence as simply analogous, grounding, constraining neither imagining consciousness nor performative constitution. And in contrast, I pointed to an account of the imaginary offered by Meloponti, which makes imaginary form a way of expressively manifesting the possibilities of the real. Sorry if that's gone on a bit long. Okay.